Welcome to the Weekend Word. I'm David Ford, and today we're going to learn how to get our greatest treasures from our darkest places. Don't change that channel. There was a man who fell into a pit. It was dark, he was lonely, so many people passed him by, some people laughed at him, some people gossiped about him, others judged him, but nobody helped him. Finally, Jesus saw the man in the pit and Jesus did not say a word, he just went down in the pit with him and sat there next to him. The man looked at Jesus and he said, why would you get in this pit with me? And Jesus looked at the man and he said, because I'm the only one who knows the way out. I don't know what you've gotten yourself into. I don't know what pit you find yourself in. I don't know what dark place you are struggling to get out of, but I do know this. I know the one who knows the way out and his name is Jesus Christ. And so I want to encourage you, wherever you are watching this message at today, Jesus can get you out. I'm going to read to you today the most famous chapter in all of the Bible. It's the most famous Psalm and the most well-known chapter. It's Psalms chapter 23. There's six verses in this Psalm. Now, every time that I share with you, I don't use notes. I'm not reading off of a camera. I'm sharing with you my heart. But as I was praying through this message, I felt like I needed to read to you Psalms chapter 23, all six verses. So if you have your Bible, I want you to take it out. If you don't have your Bible, I want you to listen in. And I want you to repeat after me. I want you to say Psalms chapter 23 out loud. Now, no one knows exactly when David wrote this psalm, but many people speculate that David wrote this psalm after he lost his infant son in 2 Samuel chapter 12. I hope that provides some context to the psalm we're about to read. Here's Psalms chapter 23, verses 1 through 6. It says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Now you will notice in the first three verses, the psalmist, David, who was a shepherd boy, is talking to us not from the perspective of a shepherd, but from the perspective of a sheep. And he's given us some great insights of how the Lord is our shepherd. In the first three verses, we find green pastures, we find still waters. In the first three verses, the psalmist is talking about God. Notice the words he uses. He says things like this, the Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. And when you have calm waters and green pastures, it's easy to believe there is a God. It's easy to say things like, God is good all the time and all the time. That's right, God is good. It's easy to talk about God when all of life is easy. But the psalmist changes his language in verse number four. And this is the context of this message today. This is where I got the title from. Listen to the words of Psalm chapter 23, verse four. David says these words, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. 
Notice how the psalmist stops talking about God and starts talking to God. In the first three verses, when there's calm seas and still waters and there's green pastures, the psalmist is talking about God. But when there is a valley of the shadow of death, the psalmist starts talking to God. I'm here to tell you today that there's something valuable in the valley. There's some great treasures we can find in our darkest places. In verse 4, the Hebrew for this verse would read like this. Now Hebrew is what is originally written in the Old Testament. It would read like this, even though I walk through the valley of deepest darkness. Maybe you're in that place right now. Maybe you find yourself surrounded by the deepest darkness in your life. I want you to know that the deliverance of God is not always to take me from it, but it's to meet me in it and lead me through it. That's the promise we have here in Psalms chapter 23, verses four and five. Even though I walk through the deepest darkness, you are with me. So God doesn't always take me from it, but he meets me in it and he leads me through it. See, there is something valuable in the valley. It's in that place that I stop talking about God and I start talking to God. Just think about the most difficult times in your life. Think about when you face storms or when you face loss. Think about when you face tragedy. It was during those times that you probably prayed more than you ever have before in your life. You see, just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you won't go through dark valleys. It just means you won't go through dark valleys alone. The Bible says he will never leave you nor forsake you. The Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 45, verse three, I just read this verse and it was like I read it for the very first time. I don't ever remember reading it before. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 45, verse three, that God has secret riches for us hidden in darkness, great treasures hidden in the darkness. So it's in these moments that we walk through the deepest, darkest valleys that we learn that the shepherd is with us in those moments. There's a few things I want you to get from these verses. Notice David does not say, though I camp in the valley of the shadow of darkness. He says, though I walk through. I want you to know if you're going through hell, don't stop. You keep going until you get through it. See, God meets you in it and he leads you through it. In the deepest darkness of the valley, we do not camp there. We keep following God through it. And eventually we will get something through it. It's in these moments that we learn he is with us in the midst of what we go through. I never forget when I was going through a really difficult time in my life. Some people were gossiping about me. Some people were spreading rumors about me and I was devastated. I felt so alone. And so as always, when I'm going through a difficult time, come on here in New Orleans, what do we do? We just go out to eat. So I told my wife, I said, let's go out to eat. And so we're at the dinner table and I'm just telling her, you know, I'm going through a really rough time and it would just be nice to know if God was with me during these challenges. And so I prayed, I said, God, I just need to know, just give me a sign that you're with me despite everything that I'm going through. When it came time for us to leave and pay the bill, the waitress said, your bill's already paid for. Somebody at that back table paid for you. So I look back and I don't recognize anybody from the table. My wife looks at me and she said, what are you gonna do? 
I said, what am I gonna do? I don't know those people, what are you gonna do? And I felt like I should go to the back table and I should just thank whoever it was that paid for me. So I go to the back table and I say, I don't know if it was a mistake, but somebody paid for me and I just want to thank whoever it was. A guy stood up and he said, God wanted me to pay for your meal. And he wanted me to tell you that he is with you right now. Man, I was so encouraged in that moment because that's exactly what I was praying for before we got to that restaurant. That God would give me a sign that he is with me in my deepest, darkest place. And it's in those deepest, darkest places that we get our greatest treasures when we realize that God is with us, a very present help in time of need. Now, maybe you're watching this today and you face some great tragedy. Maybe you've lost a child. Maybe you've lost a spouse. Maybe you've lost a mother or a father, a brother or a sister, and you're in the deepest, darkest place of your grief. First thing I want to tell you is I can't even imagine what you are going through. I have never faced that type of loss. And so I am praying for you right now. But I want to let you know, if you're watching me right now, you are still here. And God is with you, and he is going to lead you through it. You see, grief is something you never get over. It's something you go through, but you don't have to go through it alone. And so if you've been asking God for a sign, if you've been asking God, where are you? He placed me right here, right now, to tell you he is with you in your deepest, darkest valley. I want to pray for you right now. I wanted to read Psalms chapter 23 because I wanted you to find hope in God's word. Wherever you're watching this message, would you just take your hand and would you place it over your heart? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for each and every person that is watching me right now. I don't know what they're going through. I don't know what they're facing, but I do know this. They don't have to face it alone. You are a very present help in time of need. You meet us in it and you lead us through it. And so I thank you that you are with them right now, wherever they are. Would you wrap your loving arms and would you comfort them? You are the God of all comfort. Their tears are not a sign of weakness. They're a sign of strength and of love. So I pray that you would be with them in the midst of their grief right now. In Jesus' name, amen. The second group of people I want to pray for are those who don't know Jesus. Because if you don't know Jesus, you are going through the darkest valleys all by yourself. And I can't imagine going through life all by myself. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you don't know him as your Lord and as your Savior. Would you pray this prayer with me? Would you say it out loud and would you mean it with all of your heart? It's a prayer of repentance. Just say something like this. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Save my soul. Change my life and make me new. I believe that you are God. Be my Lord and be my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time, all of heaven is rejoicing. We are celebrating you right now. I hope today's message through Psalms chapter 23 added value to your life. Welcome to After the Message. I hope that that message on Psalms chapter 23 added value to your life and helped you during your darkest moments. I'm going to give you some next steps now that I believe are going to help you practically 
walk out this message. It doesn't do any good for us just to hear the word of God and not apply it to our lives. And so let's go back to Psalms chapter 23. I'm just going to share some additional truths that I see in the text that I believe are going to help you walk this out. The Bible says that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. That phrase makes me is the most aggressive language we see in the whole chapter. If you're a parent out there and you've ever tried to tell your children to go to, to, go to bed and they didn't listen to you, what was the next phrase you said? You said, if you don't go to bed, I will make you go to bed. And this is the language of the Heavenly Father, because he knows that we, as his children, we need to rest. And the Lord, being a loving Father, makes us lie down in green pastures. And so I want to encourage you practically to rest. Now, when we are driving and we pull, pull up to the light, if it is green, we what? We go. If it's red, we stop. But here in Psalm chapter 23, we see the reverse. When you see green pastures, you're supposed to stop and lie down and rest. Because if you don't, he will make you lie down because he is a loving father. So I want to encourage you practically to rest. Find rest, especially on your Sabbath day. Rest in the fact that the Lord is your shepherd. You are not your own shepherd. The Lord is your shepherd. And he makes you lie down in green pastures. He leads you besides still waters. Why are the waters calm? That's because sheep would never drink from rushing water. They will be afraid of it. See, God doesn't cause our fears. God calms our fears. He leads us besides still waters. He is our provider. He is our protector. We find rest for our souls in the Lord. I talked to you about what happens in our darkest valley moments, how there's value in the valley. But I want to read to you the next verse. It says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. The punishment of your enemies isn't always what you think it will be. Sometimes God preserves your enemies and gives them a front row seat to see what he has provided for you. But you'll notice that there is a table in the presence of your enemies. But so often our focus is on our enemies that we miss the table. Now, if you didn't hear anything else I said in this whole message, I want you to hear this point. Take your focus off of your enemies and focus on the table of God's provision. When God prepares a table for you, you don't have to beg him for a seat. His provision is there and your enemies get a front row seat to see how God is going to provide for you. I'll never forget when I was making a big transition in my life. I felt like it was one of the deepest, darkest valleys. My newborn son had RSV, which is very deadly for an infant. We were at Children's Hospital with my son. Um, I was driving my car on the interstate and my engine blew. I was facing a lot of attacks from people and I just broke down one day. I mean, have you ever been there? Have you ever felt like this is the deepest, darkest valley? Like, God, where are you? I know you promised that you're going to be with me, but it would be nice if I could feel you or see you or hear you because I feel like I'm all alone. And I was praying and I felt like I was being attacked. I felt like a serpent was attacking me. And I was just praying and crying in my truck when my engine just blew. Well, I missed a phone call, and so I returned the call. I was supposed to do a landscaping job for a customer, and I was just going through so much difficulty, I totally forgot. And so the customer called me and left a message. I felt terrible. I called them back and I apologized. I said, I'm so sorry, I'm a pastor. It's unlike me to forget about that appointment. I can go and, and help you know, cut the grass and 
do your garden and all these things. And I'll never forget what the lady told me. She said, I don't need all of those things done. She says, I'm an intercessor at my church. And when I got your number, I felt like I should pray for you. And so I started to intercede and pray for you. And my grandchildren think that I'm weird because sometimes I see visions and I saw a vision of your life. She said, I saw a serpent crawling up your leg, getting ready to bite you, but I prayed for you and I will pray for you till my last breath. I started crying even more. I've never met that lady before or since. I really believe she was an angel sent from God for me in my deepest, darkest valley. And I want to encourage you with the same words that that lady encouraged me with. I will be praying for you. Whatever it is you are going through in your health, in your finances, with your children, in your marriage, whatever deepest, darkest valley you are facing, I want you to know God is with you. Remember, he doesn't always deliver us from it, but he meets us in it to lead us through it. Think about Daniel and the lion's den. God did not remove Daniel from the lion's den, but God met him in the lion's den and saw him through. Think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace. They said, I thought we only threw three people in there. It looks like there's a fourth, and the fourth looks like the Son of God. Think about Paul and Silas. At midnight, they were worshiping God in the prison. You see how God met them in it and led them through it? What about Hagar when she was running away from Sarah? God said, go back because I see you. You see how God met her in it and led her through it? It's the same thing we see in Psalms chapter 23. We can find our greatest treasures in our darkest places. So I want to encourage you to practically rest. I want to encourage you to pray and I want to encourage you to find promises of God, how he will never leave you nor forsake you, how he is a very present help in time of need, how you should not fear for he goes with you. I want you to memorize a Bible verse about how God is with you, even in the most difficult, darkest places. I am praying for you and I can't wait to see you next week. Hey family, I hope today's message added value to your life. If it helped you in any way, would you please consider doing these two things? Number one, would you pray for this ministry? Pray that this ministry would continue to help change people's lives. And number two, would you prayerfully consider giving to this ministry? All of your donations help make it possible for me to preach every week to you. If you need additional encouragement, you can follow the links below. God bless you, and I'll see you next week. I wanted to take a moment and introduce you to my family. This is my wife, Daniela. We've been married for 10 and a half years. We have two children, Grace and Landon, and we have a third child on the way. We're so excited about what God is doing. Thank you so much for helping make this ministry possible. I wanted to encourage you with our story. As you know, I was a missionary in Mexico for over five years. One day I came back home and visited my family and I was speaking at different churches and I was at the gym. I saw some guy working out by himself and I felt led to share my faith with him. I was scared to death. I did not want to share my faith with some guy at the gym. I thought he was going to make fun of me. But I couldn't shake it. I just felt like I needed to share my faith with him. So I go up to him. I tell him about Jesus and I tell him my testimony. And he prayed with me at the gym. He accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior and he got plugged into the local church. I went back to the mission field and I came back home about two years later. And he was still at the church. 
I said, Eddie, praise God, you're still at church. He said, yeah, not only me, but now my whole family is saved. Let me introduce you to my sister, Daniela. And I married his sister, Daniela, a few years later. Here's the point. Obedience is our part, and the outcome is God's. I'm not telling you if you share your faith, you're going to meet your spouse. But I am telling you that when you share your faith and you're obedient to God, your greatest blessings are waiting for you. I met my wife because I took a small step of obedience. And I want to encourage you right now, if you're watching this and you've been praying for a godly family, you've been praying for a spouse, I want to encourage you to just take that small step of obedience. Obedience is our part and the outcome is God's. After we were married a few years, we entered a very difficult season in our marriage. We've been praying for God to come through with three specific areas, and we felt forgotten by God, much like the message I share with you today. And we felt like these three things just were never going to happen for us. The first thing was having a child. We had been praying for about five years to have a child. The second thing was to get approved for a house. Every bank wasn't approving us of anything, so we couldn't get approved to get a house. And the third thing was a place to become a pastor. And we felt like none of these things were happening and we felt like quitting and giving up. Maybe you feel like you're in that space right now. I'll never forget it was April 1st. I was on the front row of church and I was worshiping God during our time of worship. Some guy that I've never seen before or since came up to me and tapped me on the shoulder. He said, I saw a vision of your life. Now, when he told me this, I thought it was an April Fool's joke. He said, your life was like a broken clock. And I said, man, you got the wrong person. I know this is an April Fool's joke. He said, no, it represents the timing of God. Now, as you remember, my life is defined by God's time. He's never late. He's never early. He is always, that's right, he's always on time. He said the clock represented the timing of God, and it was broken, and it was broken at nine o'clock, but all at once, it jumped from nine to 12. He said, I don't know what that means, but I hope it blesses you. I went home, I didn't tell anybody else but my wife. I said, this man came up to me, he told me he had a vision of our lives. It was like a broken clock, and it wouldn't move. And me and my wife just prayed about it, and we felt like the three hours represented the three things and it would all happen in one year two weeks later my wife told me she was pregnant and we had our baby daughter grace our daughter grace is six years old now at the end of that month we saw a house that we thought we could never get approved for the lady who owned that house said god told me to give it to y'all for whatever you could get approved for and God blessed us with our house. Only one hour was missing. By the end of that year, I became a pastor at a small church. It was in that moment that God reminded me of the vision. And he reminded me he is never late, never early. He is always on time.